Hey guys, I am going to take you through some human heredity. We're going to be looking specifically at pedigrees today and then karyotypes tomorrow and how we're going to track some of the genetic disorders you looked at yesterday using these tools. So we're going to look at examples of dominant and recessive disorders and then we're going to talk about how human pedigrees can be constructed from the genetic information that we have and how we can analyze the patterns of either dominant or recessive disorders using pedigrees and karyotypes. So first of all, let's talk about recessive genetic disorders. In order to express a recessive genetic disorder, you have to be homozygous recessive for that trait. If you have even one dominant allele, then you will not express that recessive disorder. But if you have one dominant and one recessive, they call you a carrier. So whatever this disorder is, both the mother and the father up here were carriers. So they have a 25% chance of having a child with whatever that recessive condition is. They have a 50% chance of having a carrier, and then they have a 25% chance of having a completely normal child that doesn't have the, the gene for that disorder. So that's a recessive genetic disorder. Some examples, and you looked at some of these yesterday, cystic fibrosis, it's a disorder that's recessive, and it affects mucus-producing glands, digestive enzymes and sweat glands, so a lot of times you'll see these kids, they'll have to beat on their chest to get that mucus to loosen up several times a day. Um, the chloride ions are not absorbed into the cells of a person with cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, but they're excreted in the sweat. So the sweat will have those chloride ions. It causes mucus excretion that clogs the ducts in the pancreas, interrupts digestion, blocks respiratory pathways in the lungs. So that's one recessive genetic disorder. Albinism, so being albino, so here's some pictures of some albino humans. Um, any race can be albino. And then there's an example of an albino raccoon. Um, so it is caused by altered genes resulting in the absence of the pigment, pigment melanin in the skin, hair, and eyes. So they're going to have very, very pale skin, white hair, pink eyes, and that's a recessive disorder. Tay-Sachs disease, that's another recessive disorder. Um, this is the absence of an enzyme that breaks down fatty acids called gangliosides. Um, it's usually found, although this is becoming less and less um, of a absolute law, but traditionally it's found in Jewish people because people who were Jewish tended to marry other Jewish people and then they might be both be carriers for Tay-Sachs disease and then they would end up having a child with Tay-Sachs. It's a very, very um, quick moving, um, disorder where these ganglicides build up in the brain, inflate the brain cells, then cause very quick mental deterioration. These kids usually don't live past the age of five, so they get diagnosed when they're about 18 months, and then they usually don't live until past the age of five. It's just horrible disease. Okay, uh, another recessive disorder, not at all as horrible, is um, galactosemia. And it's the inability of the body to digest galactose, which is milk sugar. So you're going to have um, issues with that, stomach issues and digestive issues. <clears throat> okay. We also have dominant genetic disorders. So if it's a dominant disease and you get even one of the abnormal genes from your parent, you get the disease. So... This one would be more likely to be passed on if one parent, if you got one gene, you would be affected. Okay. Uh, so this, this father, he had one dominant gene 
and then he has a 50% chance of having an affected child. So um, it can't hide, you can't be carriers of a dominant disorder. One of the um, most well-known dominant genetic disorders is Huntington's disease, which is a horrible disease that um, you don't know you have until you're about in your 40s, and it affects your nervous system and causes gradual loss of brain function, so you really go down. Um, you'll be fully normal until you're in your 40s, and then all of a sudden you just start losing all your cognitive function and your brain functioning. Um, the problem with this disorder before we had genetic testing was people wouldn't know they'd have it until they were in their 40s, so they would have already had their children, and then they find out they have this dominant genetic disorder, and then they have to they had to worry about if they had passed it on to their kids, and their kids wouldn't know till they were in their 40s. So it's just a horrible um, timing on that because then those kids won't know that they have it. They won't know if they um, would should have kids that they might pass it on to their kids. But now we have genetic testing, so that makes that not the disease better, but it makes it better in knowing. Um, achondroplasia, you might be surprised. Um, this is, would be dwarfism, is a dominant disorder. It's not a common dominant disorder, but it is a dominant disorder causing small body size and limbs that are comparatively short, and it's caused by an abnormal gene that affects bone growth. Okay, so those are some examples of recessive disorders and dominant disorders. So one tool that scientists use to trace these disorders through families, because like I was talking about in Huntington's, it would be really good to see if you have um, a history of some disorder in your family to know what your chances would be to pass it on to your kids. So one tool that scientists use is called a pedigree. And um, this is an example of a pedigree. Um, so you might think of this as like a family tree. But the difference between a family tree and a pedigree is the pedigree is actually tr tracing the inheritance of a particular trait through several generations. So we use these shaded in circles and these open circles and squares to trace certain traits through a family. So these are some of the symbols that you will see in a pedigree, and I'm going to go through them quickly, and you can label, or you need to label them on your paper. So a square represents a male. And a circle represents a female. If I have them on the same horizontal line and I connect them with a line, then that means that they are mating. Because, of course, this is talking about biology. So what we're concerned about is who is having kids with who. So that means mating. In a family tree, you would say that means married. So hopefully those go hand in hand. Okay, then this one right here, this is parents with children. So the line going down means that you've had children. These have had two children, one boy and one girl. And you put them in birth order. So the boy was born first and then the girl. If I have a line, a triangle line like this, this is dizygotic twins, which means they came from two eggs. So they're not identical. This is monozygotic twins. So they came from one egg. And so they're identical, although this is wrong because they can't be a boy and a girl and be identical. But you get the gist. If you see it drawn as a diamond, that means that somewhere in the family history, they didn't have a notation of if it was a boy or a girl. So they just, they knew there was a child, but they're not sure if it was a boy or a girl, so they'll just put a diamond. Um, this is the number of children of that sex. So if if they had four boys, you might just see a square with a number four in it. That means they had four boys or three girls. And I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but when we have these shaded in, because this is one of the super important ones, when we have these shaded in right here, that means that these are affected individuals. So whatever disorder we're tracing, maybe it's albinism. If we shade them in, that means they have albinism. If they're open, that means they're normal. Okay, up here on the top. 
if I have half shaded, then that means they're heterozygous. So they're carriers. They have a big A and a little a. They're carriers of that disorder. Okay, this one right here where it has a dot, it could be a square or a circle, and it has a little dot in it. That, well, I say that. No, it's always going to be a circle, and I'll tell you why later. Um, this is a sex link recessive carrier. You don't know what that means yet. I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Um, so they're carrying a sex linked trait. All right, when you have a line through a circle or a square, that means there's been a death. If I have this little hexagon here, that means I've had a stillbirth or an abortion, and that child did not survive to live. Okay, this if if you see an arrow pointing to one of the people in the um, pedigree, that we call that the proband. That's the like our original case. This is the one we're investigating that we're trying to figure out the family relationship to. So. This might be, okay, I want to know, this is my grandfather, and I want to know how he got this disorder. So I'm pointing my arrow to him. Um, so right here, this gives us a full picture of a pedigree. This is first generation, second generation. And so I might say first generation individual one, first generation individual two, second generation individual one, two, and three. Okay. So here, the proband is child two in generation two. This is what we call a consanguous marriage. Consanguineous marriage. Practicing that. That is a marriage between two people that are related somehow. So usually, if you go way, way back in pedigrees, you probably would see cousins married. So that's what that means. All right, so why do we analyze these pedigrees? Well, um, knowing physical traits can help us determine what genes an individual is most likely to have. So we can infer what certain genotypes would be. So in other words, if I know my genotype and my husband's genotype, then we might be able to tell what our kids will be for that trait. We could at least tell what the chances of our children having a certain disorder are. Okay, and so that goes into this one, predicting disorders. Record keeping helps scientists use pedigree analysis to study inheritance pattern, determine phenotypes, and ascertain genotypes. So we're really, we're looking through the family to see, can we predict that these two parents might have a child with a disorder? So pedigrees, pedigrees can be used to examine both recessive and dominant disorders. Information about an individual's genotype can be inferred from the phenotype of his or her parents and offspring. So right here I can see this is, a, remember this is a recessive disorder. Parent one and parent two, so dad and mom are both carriers for Tay-Sachs. They have a 25% chance of getting a child for Tay-Sachs. So that's, this would be like perfect statistically if they had three kids that were normal and one with Tay-Sachs. That would be what the st statistics would say they would have. So this would be what a pedigree would look like for a recessive disorder. And then this would be a dominant disorder. Okay. Um, so I have some sort of dominant disorder. This one would be the recessive, okay? This dominant parent passed it on to these two kids. This dominant parent probably had to be a carrier only because if dad gave a recessive gene, mom would also have had to give a recessive gene here to this child and this child and this child, okay? So... This parent probably only had one dominant gene, and it just happened to pass that dominant gene to this child and this child. So we'll get the hang of looking at these and kind of you can tell what the genotypes. If you After you practice it quite a bit, you get to know what the genotypes will be. Okay, but one uh, or two vocabulary words before we start. 
So we know that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. The first 22 pairs, so you see here, I've arranged them from biggest chromosomes to smallest chromosomes. First 22 pairs are called autosomes. Those are just our body chromosomes. They determine um, all of our traits in our body. The last, the 23rd pair, we call our sex chromosomes. And you are either X, Y, like this one. So this would be a male, or you have an XX. And if this were an XX, then this one right here would be similar size to this one right here. So we have autosomal disorders, and then we have sex link disorders. Autosomal disorders are going to be somewhere in chromosomes 1 through 22. Sex link disorders are only going to be on these X chromosomes, okay? So let's start out with some autosomal disorders, so in chromosomes 1 through 22. Let's start out with an autosomal dominant disorder. So we're just going to say dimples versus no dimples. Dimples is our disorder, not really a disorder, but we're just going to use it as our example. We're tracing dimples through this um, family right here. So to have dimples, to have this disorder, you have to have at least one big D. So the first thing, the easiest thing to do right now, anyone who's not shaded in has no dimples, so we know they have to be little d, little d. So I'm going to put little d here, little d here, little d here, little d here, little d, little d. So little d, little d for all of these because they are recessive. So that's easy to fill in. Okay, all of the other people in this pedigree, we know they have to have at least one big D. So I'm going to put a big D, I could put a big D on all of those, okay? I could go ahead and put one big D on all of those, okay? Now, I have to figure out what the other D is. Is it a big D or a little D? Well, so I have these two parents that are big D something, big D something. They have these three kids, dimples, dimples, uh-oh, look, no dimples. So, since it has two little d's, I know that each parent had to have a little d. Okay, so I can put a little d there, and I can put big d, little d there. Because they each had to give a little d to this child. Okay? Now, let's come over here. Same thing here. This parent would have to be carrying a little d because they have a child with a little d. Okay, now the other ones, this one right here, I know it has to be big D, little d. Why do I know that? Look at mom. Mom is little d, little d, so mom had to give this one a little d. And we know it has to have a big D because it's colored in. What about these two right here? I know they have to have one big D. Can I tell what their other D is. I cannot because I don't have any information about their kids. And looking at their parents, they could have gotten a big D, big D, or they could have gotten a big D and a little D. We just don't know. So you would just leave it like this, or you might put like a, a big D question mark would be another way to write that one. So we can almost fill in all of the genotypes on this pedigree. These two we can't quite fill in. So that's autosomal dominant. Now let's look at autosomal recessive. So we're going to say normal pigment versus albino. And since A's are easier to look at than P's for pigment, I'm going to use A's. So big A is normal pigment. Little a means they're albino. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. Okay, so to be albino, you have to be little a, little a. So now in this one, it's switched. The ones that are colored in are the ones that are recessive because it's a recessive disorder. So any of them that are colored in have to be little a, little a. So I'm going to go ahead and put little a, little a for all of my individuals that are colored in because they are albino. Okay? 
then any of these that are not shaded in have to have at least one big A. So I'm going to give them all a big A, but we don't know what the second one is yet. So we have to go look at them. So I'm going to start right here with these kids, six, seven, and eight right here. These kids of these two parents, they all got a big A from mom right here. We know, we know they couldn't have gotten the big A from dad over here because he doesn't have one. The only thing dad could give these three kids is a little A. So that's what I'm going to put on all of those. Okay, so I know 6, 7, and 8. Let's do 12 over here. Same thing. So this is a child. So these two parents, if you look carefully here, had a son, a son. That's the son's wife right there. See, she's not connected right here. And then this daughter. Okay, and the daughter got a big A from dad. Mom right here had to give her a little A. Okay, now look at dad right here. They did have one son that was albino, right? So mom had to give a little A. Dad also had to give a little A. Now, this parent number two over here, we cannot put anything here because all we know is that they each got a big A, and then they got a little A, but we don't know if this was big A, big A, or big A, little A. So we cannot fill in the entire genotype here. But we can fill in this one down here. This one down here, same thing. Dad gave her a big A. Mom had to give a little A. Oh, I skipped number nine over here. That one just popped up. Let me come over here real quick. Number nine right here, same thing. Same thing as this daughter. This son got this little A over here from mom. Okay, and then this one right here is the one I was just talking about. Okay, now these two kids right here, 15 and 16. Big A, little A, crossed with a big A, little A. Okay, this one's a little A, little A. That's why we know they have a little A but we can't really say for sure what 15 and 16 got. They could be big A, big A, or big A, little A. So we can't fill in 15, 16, or 2, but we can fill in all the rest. And that's autosomal recessive. Okay, last one. Last one is sex linked, okay? And so the gene for hemophilia, which is a blood disorder, your blood does not clot um, properly. So you, if you start bleeding, it's hard for you to stop. That disorder is carried on the X chromosome. So remember, females have XX and males have XY. So the way we write these X-linked disorders is we write them as a superscript above the X. So let me show you. So if it's a normal female, she's going to have two big H's because I'm going to use H for normal, big H for normal, little h for hemophilia. Okay? She could be a carrier, so she could have a normal gene and then a hemophilia gene. A carrier female would not have hemo hemophilia. They'd just be carrying that hidden gene there. Or they could be X, little h, X, little h, which would mean they had hemophilia. So a female, to be a hemophilia, hemophiliac, a female has to have two of the hemophilia genes. Okay, males are a little different because males are XY. So if I have X, big H, Y, that's a normal male. If I have X, little H, Y, that's a hemophiliac male. Males cannot be a carrier because they only have one X chromosome. So it's much easier for males to be hemophiliacs than females because they only have to inherit one of the genes. It has to be the X gene, X chromosome. Okay, so... The pedigree is going to work like the other ones. You just write it a little bit differently. So we're tracking this recessive trait. So anyone who's colored in has the recessive trait. Okay, so this is a female that has hemophilia. So she's going to be X little H, X little H. Okay, 
And then this also is a female that has hemophilia, so X little H, X little H, and that one. Okay. The males that have hemophilia are going to be X little H, Y, X little H, Y. Okay. So those are all the ones that have it. Now, now we have to go in and fill in the ones that don't have it. Okay, so the easiest ones on this one are the males, because if they don't have it, they're X big H Y, so go fill those in. Okay, so now we have our females. This female, this female, this female, and this female. And we have to tell, are they a carrier or are they completely normal? Okay, so here's this mom, married this dad who's normal. Look, they have a son who has hemophilia. Well, dad didn't have hemophilia, right? So who had to give him the X little h? Well, it had to be mom, so she has to be a carrier. Okay? This one right here is normal, so it has an X big H. Got that from dad. But what did mom up here have to give this number six? A little h. Okay? And then these two right here, we know they have an X big H. Well, they could have gotten that from mom or dad, right? So if dad gave it to him, it could be either. So we don't know. So I have X big H, X question mark, X big H, X question mark. So those two we don't know. Okay, so that's an X linked trait. And that's where we'll be stopping today. Thank you.